Hello and welcome to this SC Insights webinar. Um, today we're going to be talking about the current state of play in the tree supply chains. Uh, I'm joined here by my colleague, Jose Hoffa. Um, and we're going to be going through all of the different stages of the battery supply chain and, and looking at what can trigger turning points from what's been a quite sort of depressing market over the past couple of months. Um, so quick introduction for those of you not familiar with SC Insights. We are a specialist lithium ion supply chain research and consulting firm. We do a huge amount of asset level due diligence, input to 43101 reports, lenders market reports, investor strategy across the supply chain, etc. We also do a lot of term sheet advisory. It's very difficult to get things built in this supply chain without some kind of take or pay off date contract. So we also advise on the commercial terms in those documents. In addition, we have a regular research product which covers the entire supply chain, looking at supply demand, price forecasts, and costs. If you'd like any more information on the company, please feel free to reach out on details, which we'll show at the end of this webinar. Um, so without further ado, you know, the plan for today is really to talk through the supply chain. There's also a Q&A function, so please do feel free to ask questions. We'll try and leave sort of 15 to 20 minutes at the end of the, the slides to go through those questions as well. I believe they can be submitted both with your name and anonymously. Um, so we'll start off looking at the, the battery side of the market. This is really what drives the demand for the rest of the supply chain. And you can see here with the, the green line that effectively what's happened is no surprise. Capacity utilization rates have been declining very rapidly as the market moves into oversupply. And on the bars there, you can see the difference between the capacity and demand for, for battery cells. So effectively, the, the light green bars there are showing that this is a market that's going to be in oversupply for some years to come, just given the, the huge scale that we've seen rolled out. Very much what's happened is, as with other industries, China's looked at the, the potential for this industry, and you've seen this huge race to scale. Um, and effectively, that means China takes up about 70% of all battery capacity globally at the moment. It's pushed the markets into oversupply on a global basis. And what that means is it's very difficult to then get investment in places like North America and Europe because effectively, when an industry is in oversupply, it will move to lower prices and it will start producing cells, as we've seen, almost at zero margin. Um, so effectively, you know, if you're trying to set up an industry that competes with an industry with zero margin, um, your return on capital doesn't look very good anymore. And that's why we're seeing a lot of delays and curtailments, you know, just this week from the likes of Norfolk and the likes of Freya people scaling back their investment ambitions and a lot of the OEMs outside of China doing that as well. Now, obviously that impacts on the rest of the supply chain, whether it be refining, electrode production, or indeed the mines themselves. And again, we'll, we'll talk through what's happening to the individual parts of the supply chain and what we could see to trigger a, a turnaround in some of those. For batteries themselves, as a bit of point denotes, effectively you won't have a a pricing turning point for batteries. This is very much a cost plus industry, but you will at some point see a return to the investment cycle um, happening in that supply chain. And that's likely to happen towards the end of the decade, given the, the sheer oversupply that we have at the moment. Now that oversupply, it may seem that most of the, the bad headlines at the moment are focused on European and North American investments, but actually the, the situation is slightly worse in China where effectively the, the order books for these cells tend to be shorter um, and the capacity utilization at many plants tends to be uh, even lower than it is at, at those ramping up plants outside of China. The, the one exception to that, I think, has been with, with CATL, you know, who just achieved such an economy of scale. I think they recently released a, a margin of about 11%, um, and that's primarily on the battery side. It also shows the bonuses of having a lot of integration in your supply chain, which, which CATL does. Um, so that's really a sort of roadmap for the future, I think, um, and shows the importance of, of having that scale. You know, what we'll see in the future is that while China's market share will fall from, you know, circa 70% of battery cell production capacity, 
um, actually Chinese companies are now investing more and more outside of China to service demand and take advantage of those research um, economies of scale that they have, of those supply chain economies of scale that they have. Um, and we see Chinese companies you know, maintaining over 60% market share. So that really means the rest of the industry outside of China is going to continue to need government support going forward. The other sort of trend that we've seen is the automotive manufacturers, and you're seeing that the supply chain is now there and are reassessing and taking a bit of a step back uh, from investments into these supply chains. They can see that the returns aren't very good um, and that's having an issue outside of China in particular as well. But moving on, you know, we can see what's happening in terms of inventories here. And it's just a very simple model to look at the five major steps of the supply chain bit of a focus on, on lithium, I'll, I'll look at the NCM materials just after this. But effectively what's happening is, you know, the, the end user side of the market is still seeing increasing demand. It's just that the rest of the supply chain is in, in over capacity or, or has happy stock levels at the moment. So effectively the, the takeaway is we're still seeing growth in these markets. You know, we're still seeing a huge amount of growth in China. Uh, new electric vehicle sales, as they denote them in China, surpassed 1 million units um, in the last month's worth of data. That's a new record. We've also seen some trade in subsidies increased in China, which again is, is really pushing that market. Rest of the industry seeing a bit of slowdown. Um, obviously, that's sometimes tied to a removal of subsidies. So in particular in Germany, we've seen a slowdown as, as subsidies come off. But in Kenya, you know, more and more, what we're actually seeing is that EVs are, are standing on their own. And when we look at the models which are being rolled out in China at the moment, these are you know, two to three years more advanced than a lot of that's being sold in, in Europe and North America currently. And they are competing with internal combustion on, on pretty much every point, including sticker price, you know, not just total cost of ownership, but also sticker price. So the the future we think could well surprise on the upside for that demand growth and that would tighten the supply chains quite a bit quicker thing to bear in mind is that you know just because the ev and maybe the the battery and cathode sides of the supply chain are in oversupply that doesn't mean that commodity prices won't rebound before that um, and indeed that's what we expect to happen the other thing to bear in mind is you know this is still a market which is very much china-led the rest of the supply chain are price takers and the next bull run that we see in this market will be again a china story um, it's not going to be driven by southeast asia it's not going to be driven by africa south america europe or north america what we have seen and perhaps sort of pointing to a few sort of rays of light um in the the investment sort of ecosystem is Inventory levels, which were very inflated in China um, earlier this year, seem to have stabilized now. So we're not seeing huge inventories on, on cathodes and lithium chemicals, etc. cetera. Um, there are ample at the moment, but it does mean that the industry is, is probably prone to, to restocking cycles. And I think, you know, in a moment, Jose will focus a bit more on, on lithium and do a bit of a deep dive there. But we're in a in a, a market now that actually restocking without the market going into a, a deficit position could well see prices increase. You're not going to see a huge sustained rally in the next couple of months, but we think we are pretty much at the nadir of pricing when it comes to, to most of the commodities going into the supply chain. And we'll we'll look at that um, in the, the coming slides. The other sort of takeaway from this slide, I think, is that, you know, once we get to these natural inventory positions, um, you know, the, you, you're sort of balanced between moving more into oversupply and more into undersupply. So, you know, it's really important to track these, these inventories. We've seen quite a few companies trying to track them recently. Um, it's still very difficult to track that inventory data when you're looking at you know, production levels, when you're looking at trade data, et cetera, typically what we actually get in the results of that analysis, it doesn't really tell us anything. The, the data is too out of date to be triggering the turning points. What, what we do at SC Insights is we speak to a number of the Chinese cell, cathode and, and lithium refinery companies to try and get an idea as to what their buying patterns will be like and 
And what we're hearing is that they are likely to increase over the coming weeks and months. Um, so hopefully that will lead into a little bit more investment coming into the supply chain and a slight recovery of prices. You know, what we're seeing at the moment is clearly unsustainable in terms of the delays and cancellations in a supply chain, which is still growing. And I'll refer you to those those two green boxes at the end. You know, these are still markets growing 15 to 20 percent every year. Um, and, you know, any slowdown in supply chain is always going to be temporary with those growth rates. And really, the demand side story hasn't changed. Um, some of the timings changed. Some of the weighting towards China has changed. But the general story is still a very bullish one. Now, going through some of the other um, chemicals here and some of the other commodity markets that we, we track here at SC Insights, you know, we'll start with nickel. Nickel prices at the moment below $16,000 per tonne. Last time I checked on the, the LME website, you're about $3,500 per tonne for sulfate. Um, effectively, at these price levels, it's very hard to make an investment into the nickel supply chain. Um, and certainly everything out of Indonesia isn't happening. We've seen closures, we've seen BHP starting to leave the, the market for nickel. Need prices over $20,000 per ton if they're going to come to the market. We're also starting to see a few questions over the future of, of Indonesian supply. Uh, we saw the Department of Labor recently in the US um, put this industry at risk of using forced labor. Uh, which would seem to put the the, the cosh on um, any potential free trade agreement or having this material become Inflation Reduction Act compliant in the US. So there's a few questions there. And again, we're seeing ongoing environmental questions. But, you know, what happens when you look at the Indonesian industry on a holistic basis and its environmental impact? Um, it's again, it seem to be some questions there. That said, the future of Indonesian, of, of nickel supply is still very firmly tied um, so, you know, that's one that we track on a, a very close basis. The other thing to bear in mind with <clears throat> nickel and, and to be honest with most of the other markets as well is that anything that's recently been built and almost that entire supply chain in Indonesia focusing on the battery side has been recently built, will have taken on quite a bit of debt. They will be servicing that debt at the moment. And it means that the calculus for actually slowing down production um, is very different. You know, these guys will keep producing uh, for, for years to come, even if they're slightly underwater. Um, so, you know, the, the supply response in nickel um, is is relatively slow. And I think overall, we, we were discussing this earlier, you know, we, we would probably give a, a bit of a, a B minus to the, the nickel market at the moment from a, an investor perspective. Moving on to cobalt. Um, you know, as you probably be aware, you know, cobalt is primarily a byproduct from the copper industry in the DRC or from nickel um, or arsenic elsewhere. And, and you know, so a little bit from platinum group metals as well. Very much in oversupply at the moment. Um, its supply future is not really its own. You're seeing huge amounts of inventory build up there, both in DRC in the in South Africa where it's often shipped from and then in China itself now in China what we've interestingly seen in the cobalt market is a lot of those intermediate products that are being imported particularly hydroxide these aren't the most stable um, compounds to to be storing so what we're seeing is a lot of that is now being converted into metal and then that metal is immediately being warehoused um, so again, it looks like it will probably take several years at least for that market to balance again. Cobalt in itself from the battery side of the market has the, the, the slowest growth rate because you're still seeing that um, thrifting away from, from cobalt. You're seeing less cobalt being used in NCM cells, in manganese cells, and you're also seeing an increase in market share from LFP and LFMP um, type technologies as well. Interestingly enough, though, when it comes to the, the NCM supply chain outside of China, which a lot of Western industry is, is really reliant on, we've been surprised by how slow LFP and LFMP in particular have been taking market share. You know, these are industries which have seen huge growth in China and in China where there's a choice as to what you buy um, on, on the sell side. You know, LFP is taking a huge amount of market share. 
LFMP again was a little bit slower than we expected, but I think that's part of you know why would you make new investments when you when your old investments are still um, chugging along. <clears throat> the OEMs outside of China still also seem pretty much committed to the NCM supply chain. Um, I think that could partly be because you know this was where their focus was when they were making investments into the supply chain when we were seeing these major announcements happening and, and big amounts of, of funding going into the supply chain. And effectively, you know, the, the NCM cells go into the premium models where, where effectively you can afford to have a slightly more expensive battery because you make so much more margin on the end product. Um, with LFP, it's a lot more difficult to, for OEMs to commit to that level of investment because these typically go into the lower margin vehicles. So they're much more price sensitive and actually investing in a higher cost European or North American supply chain makes less sense than sourcing those cells from Asia. So all in all, lot looking good for Cobalt. And I think we're giving that one a D um, on our completely made up scale of, uh, of, of the different commodity markets. On the manganese side of things, not a huge amount better. Um, you know, effectively, this is an, an industry similar to the graphite industry where the current Chinese spot market price is lower than the incentive price to build outside of China. So we've got quite a few good projects, manganese projects outside of China, but they're struggling with some of the financing until they can lock in a higher price level than the current China spot price. And, you know, interestingly enough, that is happening. You know, we, we have spoken to a lot of the OEMs and cathode producers. They are managing to you know, sign these off-take contracts with a slight cost plus um, component to them. It's moving forward slowly, but we, we have seen an indication that these companies, these consumers are willing to pay a premium for non-China material. In the USA, that's a lot easier because of the structure of the Inflation Reduction Act and the 30D tax credits, which are effectively the $7,500 maximum credit you can get for having non-Chinese material in your batteries. Um, so effectively, we're, we're seeing some uh, willingness to pay a premium there for uh, non-Chinese manganese. Probably a bit of a hiatus until after the US election at the moment. You know, the, the view is that, that if we, we do have another Trump administration, they will try and walk back on the 30D credits. 45X probably the, the tax credits looking a lot safer. Uh, because that spending is primarily in red states. And, and by definition, if he wins, even more of it would be in red states. But there's some questions over those tax credits and the future of a premium. We'll obviously know more in November. Um, so overall, probably slightly better than, than Cobalt. We're going to give a, a C plus there to the, the manganese market. Um, last slide for me before hanging, up, handing over to Jose. Quick look at the, the anode side of the supply chains. You can see from our price forecasts here that we are relatively bullish um, when it comes to a resurgence in, in the anode supply chain from flake graphite through to uncoated and, and indeed coated uh, spherical bite pricing. Um, that's driven by uh, effectively the, the market rebalancing in China and again a, a willingness to, to pay a premium outside of China. These are forecast Chinese prices. So, you know, this isn't just a, a, a resurgence that we expect outside of the China market. This is based on, you know, full supply and demand analysis for the entire market there. Um, these, you know, again, it's an industry that's in a huge amount of oversupply at the moment. But some of the challenges we're seeing in China, some of the environmental legislations coming in um, should see a bit of a cost push uh, from this increase there when we look at that side of the market as well. So I think we're, we're relatively bullish, although I haven't given a, a grade on that one. I guess it would be a, a B or a, a B plus for, for the, the outlook there. Um, with that, for the, the big one, I think most of the interest here is on is on lithium. I will hand over to to Jose with his his favorite lithium rainbow slide likewise well thanks so much Andy uh, greetings to our loyal audience uh, which is doubling with every episode so thanks for your time and attention um yeah without further introduction this is one of our uh, beloved slides 
the lithium price rainbow revised version in this case we just updated this one with the latest price trends uh, downwards unfortunately but uh, all in all what you can see in this slide is that from the most uh, i would say positive brackets going down uh, where basically the producers are moving uh, from producing as much as possible to slowing down the production then um, where the supply response begins to detriment the um, the output and finally where capex is revised and uh, you get delays in opex to where finally on the bottom side you just um, wait for cost deflation and for a market rebalance which is unfortunately the spot where we're entering at the moment um, not very dissimilar to the other battery materials in this case is a little bit more critical in the sense that lithium is entering the er we see on that red stars on the on the bottom where we are basically crossing the the ten thousand dollars per per metric ton mark and this is uh, well it's quite impressive obviously remembering the the heights of the current cycle around eighty thousand dollars per metric ton but it's gonna be even more dramatic and more impressive once we move to our latest estimations of cost yes indeed we we are developing a lot of work for our customers in terms of technical commercial and financial price estimations but uh, to move to the second part of this slide, uh, and this is a, a reminder, you already know that we are not a, a, a very a big fan of, of uh, the optimism around Lepidolite. We, we decided to put a couple of bullet points over there, reminding the audience that uh, not all the Lepidolite is created the same at the moment. Um, the majority of the Lepidolite producers are out of the business. The ones remaining are Chinese players that are subsidized by the government, A, B, is saved by the byproducts of tantalum and niobium, and C, um, lipidolite assets that belong to critical companies that are obviously supported by the government. So um, anyway, what has happened to, and uh, as a takeaway from this slide with some of the spodiumine producers in Australia is there are uh, without a doubt underwater. And you, Everybody in the industry saw the news on uh, Arcadium now and Mount Catlin going to uh, carry maintenance. It won't take long before Mount uh, Marion and even Pilgangura under this current price situation uh, go the same route. It doesn't mean that the price cannot rebound, as we're going to show in the next couple of slides. And fa one final remark before we move to the next one is that Lepidolite might not be the highest cost source of lithium bear in mind that mid of the next decade one million metric tons of lithium coming from secondary supply needs to hit the market and that might uh, be the be the end up being the the the, the right hand side of the cost curve let's move to the next one Derek so this is another slide that we love as well a, a new one for our audience which is the bye bye margins ones you might have seen this on social media we share it uh, last week and it's it's quite eye-opening in the sense that we took best case scenario the um, tier one refining cost operations and in a hypothetical hypothetical um, exercise that uh, well qualifies to companies such as Gangfeng, Bianchi, Albemarle and some others that do have both operations inland China and Australia. So this is best case scenario and you could see that between the concentration operations and the further uh, refining and conversions through lithium carbonate in this case the margin starts to uh, decline and decline sharply especially um, since uh, q1 2023 at the moment uh, most of tier one customers are barely 
um, surviving in this uh, scenario, a scenario of close to $770 per metric ton of SC6, despite most of them producing below a 6%, um, which basically uh, shows us that for a tier two uh, Chinese, basically a tier two standalone Chinese refining, refiner, uh, numbers don't add up. Basically, they're losing money at the moment. And finally, not even mentioning the situation of European or American standalone refiners, which at the moment uh, basically cannot, um, cannot survive under or cannot actually make any money under current circumstances it's basically I'd, I'd, um, I'd, I just to jump in there Jose you know not only it is the the, the the nascent refining industry in Europe and North America that that's under pressure with future financials but you know we occasionally help some of our clients try and place material and what we're seeing with this low margin environment is a lot of the Chinese refiners are really pushing this into a toll refining business. Um, you know, they no longer no longer want to take on price risk when margins are this low. When margins were high, you know, you would sell them material and they would sell it on themselves and they'd make money on it. Now, when you offer them material, really much they, what they're really interested in is just toll refining. Um, so again, pushing that part of the supply chain cost plus. And, and that in itself may have a an impact on the structure of the industry in future and, and where margins are made. Um, in, in Lithium. Indeed. Uh, if we move to the next slide. So it is quite important, obviously, to take into consideration the supply demand balance and the dynamics between both of them. But similar, similarly, or even more important, is to uh, track the days of inventories. This uh, tool has helped us in the in the lithium market before in the last couple of cycles, and it's definitely going to help us today in order to predict where the prices might rebound, which may end up being sooner than than later. Uh, here you can find a couple of of um, of uh, standards in the sense that three months of inventory looks a little bit too abundant, and most of the companies don't don't get. Don't hit that that mark. As opposed to the three months of inventory, they typically tend to have healthy inventory levels around the two months, close to 60 days of inventories, as you can see. Um, but in all, uh, in some of the situations, especially before a rebound of pricing, uh, the inventory levels tend to go down, sometimes even below the one month uh, demand mark. And this is really interesting because in terms of supply and demand with such a big levels of, of uh, figures, it's very difficult to lose a little bit the, the sense of where the market is going. And this, obviously, when you uh, frame the, the same uh, problematic in terms of in, uh, days of inventories, it tends to be even, I would say, more volatile, more flexible, and even intuitively, intuitively more correct to be over the, the inventory prices. Um, in, terms of, in terms of figures, we also took a look on the, the same numbers, but uh, um, tonnage, tonnages per day. And uh, that is another tool that can reflect pretty, pretty good um, the sentiment on the market. Huh? Yeah, and again, I, I just sort of highlight on on this one that when you look at the the tonnages that are required um, to move the market, you know, from a, a, a relatively comfortable position that we're in at the moment to a you know position of of restocking um, and those those inventory levels falling, it's actually still a quite quite a tight market um, all throughout the the mid of this decade. So, you know, our current view is that you will have a turning point in 2026. So you can see the decline there in 2027. That means you'd get a turning point in 2026. It's possible that will come earlier. Um, you know, there, there are still in lithium some questions about where supply will come from. And 
um, in a couple of slides time, we'll, we'll talk through the production costs of different routes in, in some detail. Um, but, you know, I think that the biggest questions for us are, will China continue to ramp up an industry that, you know, effectively isn't making any money at the moment, either on extraction or, or refining? Um, and also what happens to a lot of the expansions that we've seen recently in, in Africa and in, in particular in Zimbabwe, um, where it, I wouldn't say it's necessarily opaque, but the level of shipments coming out and the quality of those shipments is, is something there's still question marks over and, and whether, again, they continue with that ramp up of expansions in Africa if they're not making money at today's pricing um, is, is probably a big question mark over the future of, as to whether the market's in, in deficit or not. Jose, so back to you. Thanks so much, Andy. If we move to the next slide, uh, this is a very interesting one, to, obviously to show and uh, that um, similarly to, to projects in terms of, of demand itself coming from either electric vehicle uh, production, energy storage systems, or even portable, we are always talking about plans, projects that are, first of all, not, not built yet. Secondly, they are not um, in operation, meaning that they haven't reached steady state. So this is an, an ongoing study that we keep doing from the demand side. But, um, Lately, the majority of our efforts have been put on the cost side of things. Moving to the next slide. Yeah, actually, just 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 before that, Jose, I just wanted to jump in because I did want to mention, you know, that we we recently put something out on on social media, sort of criticizing um, cost analysis in the lithium industry, and I think it's just important before we look at our own um, overview of cost analysis that we do look at, you know, quickly as to why that happens um you know and i was sort of slagging off uh, some of the the providers for having inconsistent costs but you know i think mean, we're also guilty myself at, at, at other companies of, of publishing some pretty rubbish cost analysis um when it comes to lithium and the reason for that is you know 60 percent of what you're modeling doesn't currently exist so you're very reliant upon engineering studies which themselves are relatively inaccurate uh, in their forecasts and, and you're dealing with an industry that saw absolutely huge cost inflation um, as prices went very high and is now in a deflationary environment. So those estimates are changing all the time as to what the production costs will be. Um, so it is it is a very difficult industry to model. Um, and you know we've been putting a, a lot of work into that with, with some of our clients over the past couple of months, looking at assets where we actually have a really good view of where we've had qualified people working on those assets where we know what the underlying assumptions are. So I think we've, we've, we've now had a really good insight into what's happening with, um, with lithium production costs and, and actually how the cost curve will, will develop over the, the coming decade. Um, so now Jose is going to talk you through some of the, the key sort of types of supply that we have in the lithium sector. And, and it's important to understand, you know, one of these columns will effectively drive the long run incentive price uh, or going forward. Um, and I think our, our expectation is, you know, that it, it certainly won't be the, the low grade ores on the, the, the 25,000 level, but uh, will be one of the other categories just to the, the left of that. Jose, over to you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That that makes total sense. Um, it's, it's worth to to um, to remind our, our, our audience and everybody who's listening that um, it's very difficult to estimate and to model projects that uh, don't exist, first of all, on one hand. But on the other hand, I I believe that cost modeling has been taken quite uh, lightly. Huh? It is uh, Typically, it is a process with a methodology of gathering indistinctively a lot of a lot of values put out by the companies without any filtering nor waiting in from a technology point of view. And um, we, in that respect, what we have done in several um, due diligences, projects with our customers has been, first of all, trying to agree on the technology first, gathering the most reliable 
um, information and backing it up with a, an analysis coming from economists, a specialist in finance, and uh, mining engineers in order to tackle exactly what will be the cost per technology. And we are getting better and better on, on, that, uh, on that exercise in the sense that at the moment we have done revisions of tier one um, brine operations, uh, tier two brine operations, conventional and, and with DLE, tier one uh, hard rock uh, Australian uh, production, tier two Australian pro uh, production. And lately we have dived into clay tier one, clay tier two, um, geothermal brines in, in North America. And obviously it's, uh, it's always mandatory to go and take a, another look, another revision into lepidolite because there's quite a lot of difference between assets such as Yishun 414, Yishun 411, uh, then the CADL uh, assets uh, and, 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 and the rest of them. And the rest of the others there are pretty much out of business at the moment. Uh, but anyway, uh, a couple of takeaways from this slide, probably one of the most important of this uh, webinar is that um, there is still a lot of advantage in terms of cost coming from Chilean tier one. Uh, this is, remember again, that this is a C1 cost. It gets a little bit distorted after we start to add the, the royalties, uh, the royalties to, to Corfo. But in terms of C1 cost, it's, it's still quite competitive. Um, second takeaway is that we did also did a revision on the Argentinian tier one projects. Uh, they're a little bit more bulkier at the moment than what we showed a couple of, of webinars before. But in, in very important nowadays is the cost that we are getting at geothermal integrated assets. Why is that? Because to our surprise, it still it still beats the cost C one. Speaking about C one, this changes with all the different regions of a standalone spodiumine assets. That's really really interesting, and uh, because we all know that ramping up a brine project is difficult. It takes time. It takes a lot of resources, uh, but then again, it tends to be quite competitive when you compare it with uh, non-integrated spodiumine assets. And, and this is something that I'm not, I'm not making it up. This is something that you can check from the, from the latest news where you see uh, Australian assets going out of business and, and the other ones in, in red numbers. No? That, is, that was quite a big surprise for us. Uh. Um, Andy, I don't know if you want to add something to this one. Obviously, to and I finished with this this is last thought. This is obviously not the cost curve that we're getting. Uh, this is as much as we can show in this webinar because the majority of the detail is is going to our customers. Huh? Um, yeah, obviously we're sort of limited in what we'll, we'll give away for free on the cost analysis. But um, you know, I think what is important to take note is that the shape of the cost curve is going to change, um, and that you know the the levels of investment at the moment, which are going into the supply chain are clearly not enough. Um, you know, clearly you're not gonna have a market that's under, seeing underlying growth 15% a year and people are closing mines or delaying expansion plans. So that will change. The big question is, you know, which of these columns needs to be incentivized? Um, I'd say it's pretty likely that, you know, by the time you get to F, you need some of those. Um, and that means, you know, you've got a relatively steep production cost curve where, where people will be able to make substantial margins, you know, particularly if they can ramp up their, their DLE technologies on a consistent basis um, and meeting what they, they say they will. Um, we also know we're going to have a disconnect between supply and demand, so we'll have volatile pricing. And that means, you know, quite often that swing supply, that, you know, that really low grade ores will come into the market. There's plenty of refining capacity for the next couple of years at least. Um, so, you know, probably that would keep a lid on prices breaking out to the to the north side, to the other side. Um, but, you know, it's uh, it's a relatively finely balanced thing. And I know we're going to come back to this in the, in the Q&A as well. Yeah. Um, 
Jose, did you want to do this one before we yeah, move really on to prices? Quickly. We want to do about another another five minutes on the on the webinar, if that's all right, just because we can see we've already got lots and lots of questions from from the audience. Yeah, just very quickly, let me, uh, for the sake of the, the, the webinar, go through this. A uh, couple of as assumptions, or main, more than assumption, is level of detail of our cost curve. So we, we, we did take this quite seriously in the sense that whenever we build a cost curve, we go and simulate um, in terms of, of uh, financial. Basically, it's a financial model with all the geological, physical, operational capital information that we can find around um, its very um, detailed and in-depth which also includes uh, financial assumptions, even the royalties and the price profile. Um, all that together gives us a lot of flexibility when we are, for example, finish the C1 cost and we want to go through C2 and C3. So we start adding the repayment of the capital, the royalties, um, the buy product credits, and finally the price profile. Everybody knows that the Chilean royalty is depending on the on the price uh, scenario. Okay, let's go to the next one. Andy, you want to take this one? Yeah, sure. So um, again, just looking at the lithium market, you know, in terms of the outlook and price forecast, we've we've actually set up our models to do a, a number of scenarios now, but um, I think I've shown this before. And effectively, you know, our view is very much that we are at the nadir of pricing. We're in a very unsustainable position. And that ultimately, when you look at what needs to be incentivized going forward, um, you know, we need quite substantially higher prices than today. Um, the other thing is, you know, even before moving towards that cost analysis, which, which we and others typically use to make our long-term price forecast, that's when this goes flat at you know, just over $20,000 from the 2030s. We, you know, previous to that, we look at the supply demand balance and are you going to see shortages? And every week that we have these low lithium prices, you are seeing projects that we need by the end of the decade being delayed um, and delayed and delayed. So, you know, nothing's really moving at the moment and it's going to create a, a world of hurt. You know, when we thought that 2022 was bad uh, for lithium supply, you know, for, for, you know, for those of us who buy it, you know, we're, we're setting up a, an even greater shortage in the future. Now, that greater shortage in tonnage terms doesn't necessarily mean that prices will spike as high, although here, you know, we're saying they, they probably will, albeit relatively briefly under this scenario. But um, yeah, it's it, it's almost sort of almost darkest before the dawn. Um, if the company's going to survive, it will probably be very well placed. But the question is, you know, is it going to survive? Um, with that, Jose, I think we're going to talk just quickly about some of the recycling side of the market, and then we will move to uh, Q and A. Yeah, indeed. Just very briefly, uh, let me walk you through two um, graphs. Uh, the, the 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 left hand side being obviously the supply, uh, hopefully coming from different sources, different categories. You can find all their brine, brine DLE, uh, all sources of hard rock, and, and finally secondary in green. What is really important about this graph is the figures, the levels. So basically we have gone through the 1 million mark and supposedly we're gonna be doubling every two, every five years, depending obviously of the appetite of uh, final customers. Um, but on the right hand side, you can find something even more interesting in the sense that this is like a, um, like a rephrasing under of the same values, but under different categories. This shows um, the existing brine operations, but you can see we're um, still waiting for some of the political news on the brine side. If so, they don't, don't grow that much. Um, hopefully it, it doesn't go go lower. The then the existing stack on top, the existing spodumene producers, obviously as as usual, increasing their 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 output despite the the very negative conditions, and lepidolite. You know that we are not a big fan of lepidolite, 
and to finish with the existing other producers. But what's really important about this slide is the amount of new uh, supply that needs to hit the market, and especially the operational cost of that uh, of that supply, which is something that we are modeling and studying um, every week. On recycling, on the secondary supply, it's no secret that LFP is uh, uneconomical to, to recycle. Even, even with, with high prices, it is um, a question mark for all the, all the players involved in the market. But nowadays, what's happening, this is where we are extremely careful in terms of the economic, the office and capex of recycling facilities, is that is. I, I can't remember of any other period where all the related battery materials have been down, such as today, where you can find the prices of cobalt, nickel, and manganese at uh, low levels. And this has been putting a lot of pressure over um, existing recycling facilities and the new ones ahead as well. Yeah? Yeah, exactly. So, you know, very difficult to make money in the recycling industry today. It's an industry that, in theory, you know, we know it will be legislated for. So it could well be a cost um, to, to the tree production going forward um, as well. Um, I think we'll move directly to the, the Q&A session now because we've got a huge number of questions. We'll try and get through as many of them as possible. Um, we will start off with, why do you think the Chinese government is subsidising domestic lithium production um, and in your opinion what is the rationale for suppressing lithium prices ultimately won't China need to secure ex China supply which is facing significant underinvestment um, the, the view of sort of China subsidizing or manipulating the the lithium market is, is quite a widely held one what I would say is a I don't think that you know this is the central Chinese government trying to manipulate the market. But if you look at what the Chinese central government do want to do, it is effectively make money selling vehicles. You know, they don't want to make money selling lithium. They don't want to make money selling nickel. They don't want to make money selling cobalt. They want to make money selling batteries and vehicles. So they perhaps take a more holistic look at the supply chain than, than most of us do. And you can have you know parts of a, a much larger supply chain which are, are in the, the, the red, whereas as long as the entire supply chain is in the, in the black. So that level of vertical integration that we have in China is, is you know, perhaps more important when, when looking at the lithium industry. The other thing that's worth mentioning when it comes to subsidies is quite often these are done at a local basis, um, you know, subsidizing individual operations. And when you look at the provincial governments or even local governments in China, you know, the number one thing that they have to do is create and sustain jobs. And, you know, it's very difficult to close assets. You know, it's very unpopular as it is anywhere in the world, but particularly in China. So what you'll see is, you know, local governments stepping in to, to try and keep operations running until the market improves. We've also heard with some um, potential sort of lipidolite operations, it's also stockpiling a lot of waste products, potentially some cord cutting um, at the moment on environmental practices um, in, in the Chinese uh, lipidolite sector as well. So. Again, I think you know that is a sector that's under pressure at the moment, but it's a, a sector which can absorb that pressure um, slightly better than the the ex China supply chain. Jose, any comments on that? Uh, no, I think you covered it no, all. Doesn't need to be. Um, so we mentioned about graphite, so coated ferrous purified graphite there aren't any in north america so how will pricing react in the short term um just i mean a quick mention on on graphite prices ex china you know the, the only real reference you have is what's happening in china typically what we're seeing in contracts at the moment is there in a, is an element of cost plus coming in and and you know if you're having a floor price which is relatively high compared to the current market price typically what happens in those contracts is you will link to a market price, um, you know, will be at the China price. And what happens is when that price increases, you don't get all of the return for that. So, you know, if the price goes from you know 1,000 to 2,000, you may get 500 and your, your customer gets the other 500. So that's something that we're starting to see that kind of banded um, 
pricing mechanism in the graphite market. Next one, what is the status of Tesla's conversion operation in Texas? Um, I'm going to throw this out to you, Jose, but um, I know they're still hiring people. I had a quick look on their, their hiring jobs page at the moment. But I, my, my view is that I'm, I'm surprised that one hasn't been cancelled yet or at least put on a go slow. Potentially, and this is the, I've got no proof to this whatsoever. I think it might be related to them them moving their, their residency I, to, I, I uh, to Texas. Think, yeah, I don't think it ever started. To, to, I mean, um, yeah, but it is, it is, um, we haven't heard any any major news on that that uh, we find. No, they're playing the cards close to the chest. There, there were some pictures showing the construction, which, which seems to be ongoing recently, but um, it's, I, I don't think they would make that investment now. I think we'll, we'll leave that one there. Yeah. Um, which regions and projects outside of China do you see as having the most potential to become key players in lithium or battery metal supply chain in the next decade? Great question. Um, Jose, who do you think the winners will be geographically? Well, geographically, and we, we've mentioned this a couple of times, is um, in my opinion, Argentina. Argentina is, is the one with the largest I would say new projects in the in the pipeline for the next five, then the next ten years in in number. Um, so far, despite brine production being not not easy to ramp up, those are projects that are in, uh, already in 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 construction, or ready to to hit the market. And um, Brazil, I would say. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, then do you expect any government intervention, subsidies, price guarantees, and etc., in order to preserve non-Chinese industries such as lithium and nickel? Um, do you see any signs of that happening? I I think you know we we we've seen a huge amount of subsidy already in this supply chain. You know, the Inflation Reduction Act is a really obvious example. And, and to be honest, that's just federal level subsidies. You know, in the US you get huge state level subsidies as well. I think the change that we need to see in Europe and North America is actually a change to how financing is, is operating and have much deeper pools of capital when it comes to financing, you know, strategic industries. Because it's clear that at the moment we're not competing outside of China with how quickly China scales industries. And that means that they're getting a huge advantage in terms of, you know, R&D spend going forward. Um, we saw yesterday that, you know, the Europe was initially sort of, so one report was saying potentially Europe needs to invest another 800 billion um, euros a year into to industry. And, yeah, that doesn't surprise me because that's what needs to change. It's so hard for people to get financing at the moment that you do need the strategic investors looking at strategic industries where they're not actually that interested in, in the return because, you know, China's more interested in building the supply chain rather than looking at a return at the moment so that needs to change hmm. um then we'll move on to, to, to how do u.s oil field brines um sit fit in the uh the cost slides okay so do you any mention or, or view on production costs for oil field brines yes uh, there are some some companies that with with model can't give you a, 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 a number right now, top of my head, but uh, it should be sitting in the middle. Yeah, and I, I think we we have that, you know, around seven and a half thousand dollars per ton. Some projects are, are, are expecting to be quite a bit lower. I think, you know, we'll, we'll have to wait and see on that. You know, with, with all of these specialty chemicals, you know, consistency is absolutely key. And if you've got, you know, some sort of iron exchange or, or, or the process involving filters, then that consistency can be very difficult to do. Or sometimes you have to reduce your production levels to meet the consistency requirements and to meet the, the consistency grades that you, you need. And as soon as you reduce tonnage, you've got to allocate all your costs to the lower tonnage. Um, and that, you know, pushes your position up on the cost curve quite dramatically. Um, da, 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 then I'm just trying to put some of these in to sort of group them together. Um, okay, do we think hydroxide, not carbonate, will be competitive in Argentina? Um, we've already covered the oil field brines. 
Jose, any comment on hydroxide versus carbonate premiums and indeed discounts um, that we've been seeing over the past year or so? Yeah, if, if you ask me today, um, under current market conditions, no, it makes absolutely no sense that the premium is, is not there, basically, for, for any of the any of the markets. If, if you uh, um, analyze it under the Chinese perspective or the Northeast Asian perspective, and I guess the question is, 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 is linked to the POSCO project of producing hydroxide in, in Argentina as well. Um, which is a big challenge to do it over there. In the case of SQM, for example, the largest producer of, of lithium, they, they um, limited the production in Chile because it was more, um, they limited it to, to 30,000 metric tons because it is more convenient to produce it straight by an integrated process between Australia and um, and China. So the, the answer is no. The, the, um, from a strategic perspective, no. From a um, technical perspective, I would say no again, because the material could cake if you're transporting that um, from the, the southern hemisphere to the northern hemisphere. And finally, because it's it's more competitive coming from um, hard rock in Australia. Yeah. Um, okay, then how do we see European OEMs looking to capitalise Oh, do we see European OEMs looking to capitalize on cheap and available cells from China? Um, what will be the knock-on impact on the European supply demand for cathode active material? Um, not a great question. And I think the the problem we're seeing at the moment is this sort of slowdown in OEMs' plans in Europe and the, their view that they can sort of push back targets and have more plug-in hybrids. Um is is really sort of slowing down the, the whole supply chain. So we're seeing, you know, not enough movement in cathode, not enough movement in anode. Um, it really needs to change. I don't think they see the future as necessarily being, you know, importing Chinese batteries um, in the long term, probably for the energy storage markets. That That is the long term um, as to what will happen in Europe. But for OEMs, you know, they view having local supply chains or regional supply chains, I should say, because most large OEMs have production sets uh, in, in different areas. Their view is actually to bring, um, you know, Asian producers into Europe and into North America. Um, I think that's a trend that will continue. And, you know, if you look at all of the battery plants which are going up in North America at the moment, the majority of them are still Asian companies, um, you know, majority actually South Korean. In Europe, a bit of a mixed bag, but we we're going to see more and more Chinese companies coming in. We'll see more and more Chinese partnerships, and ultimately, what we'll see is more Chinese investment um, into into Europe. Yeah. Um, Jose, did you have anything you wanted to add on that one? Well, yeah, I'm 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 a bit biased on that uh, topic in the sense that I I've seen it with my own eyes that the heart of the uh, European electric uh, revolution is, is is Chinese. I mean, the, the batteries chosen by, uh, especially by German OEMs, they, they are, um, everybody knows where they come from. Well, I like this one. If you personally had to buy a new car today, would you buy an EV or go for internal combustion or hybrid or wait for a better technology? Um, go on, Jose, you do that one and then I'll, I'll give my view. Well, I'm I'm biased on that one as well because I drive a V8, so I'm I'm waiting to 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 jump and upgrade to a V12, and then I'm going to buy a, an electrical one. Okay, um, from my side, I do drive an a fully electric car. Um, I I would yeah, it would be great to have a little bit more range, but very happy with it. Um, but you know, we charge from home, so it's kind of a no brainer. Um, the one thing I would say is I, I think, you know, a lot of the people we speak to on the plug-in hybrid side, you know, see it as the best of both worlds at the moment. For us, that's really not the case. You know, talking to a lot of engineers recently who work in repairing these vehicles, I think increasingly it's going to be seen as the worst of both worlds. You know, you're carrying two technologies, two supply chains, you've got increased costs, the maintenance costs are uh, even higher potentially than internal combustion and 
once these plug-in hybrids get to three or four years old and start needing maintenance, whereas, you know, a full electric vehicle doesn't, um, I think that the consumer sentiment will change quite quickly on them. And, and that's going to cause a lot of pain for, for some of the, the OEMs who are now tracking on full electric and, and going down the, the plug-in hybrid route. Um, that does bring us to time on the webinar. Um, apologies, there are almost 20 questions we haven't got to. If they are weren't submitted anonymously, we will try and email you on those. Or please do feel free to reach out and email uh, myself, Jose, or Derek, our commercial manager here. Um, and with that, we will end there. Thank you all for your participation. Thank you.